From Wondery, I'm Rob Delaney. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal. So, Alice, that's it. We finished the series about Jonathan Aitken, the disgraced Tory MP turned priest. What have you learned from these past episodes? Well, one of the things I've realised is that I've not been open-minded about my career options. In his peak, Jonathan Aitken looked like he was going to be the country's next prime minister, his record, frankly, unblemished. And then suddenly, it turns out he's got a very shady past going back decades. And then he becomes a man of the cloth. So, Rob, actor now, marine biologist tomorrow. Don't limit yourself. (laughs) (laughs) How does it all come to light, though? A simple hotel bill. Well, you said shady past, but I don't think that does his time in Parliament justice. Because it included arms dealings with Saudi businessmen. Oof. Making sure they were supplied with booze and women. Of course. The two necessities. But all the way through, everything he did was driven by his career aspiration. All he wanted was the top job in number 10. And who could blame him? And he was willing to basically do anything to get it. And by anything, I mean willing to make his wife and daughter, teenage daughter, stand up in court and lie in order to save his reputation. Now, that is ambition. So if anybody out there is saying that they are striving for the job they want, you're not unless you're doing this. Yeah. I mean, I want to caution our listeners because this is going to sound like a how to become a CEO psychopath. (laughs) I mean, these are like daily meditations for the scumbag (laughs) trampler of people, (laughs) both strangers and those that you love. So don't take notes on this. Just use it with a pinch of salt. Yeah. Big pinch. Big shovel full of salt. Another uh, CEO (laughs) daily meditation tip that he offers us is if you want to do well in your job, date your boss's daughter if your boss is Margaret Thatcher. What is mad is we wouldn't have heard about this scandal. It would have just been buried with all the other corruption we presume we don't hear about if it wasn't for one journalist. The journalist you're speaking of, of course, is David Lee. You may remember him from my unbelievable impression of him, which I did record before actually meeting him and speaking with him. (laughs) Now, it is likely I will receive a prison sentence comparable (laughs) to Jonathan Aitken for butchering. I didn't know I was butchering. I thought I was tributing. But when you hear his real voice, you'll know it's a butchery and I deserve punishment. He's a man who in his career and personal life has been through worse. The turmoil of your accent, I'm sure, will be water (laughs) off a duck's back. He was an investigative journalist and he was the one that revealed that Aitken had lied about the Paris Ritz bill. He's also more recently worked on uncovering a little-known project called WikiLeaks. Mm, You don't want them knocking at your door. No, sir. He joins us next. Whether you're a Sherlock Holmes aficionado or not, you're going to love the latest instalment in Audible's original series, Moriarty, The Silent Order. It's a follow-up to last year's smash hit thriller, Moriarty, The Devil's Game. And this time, Holmes and his nemesis have to set aside their mutual loathing and work together to defeat a truly evil force, played deliciously by Helen Mirren. Dominic Monaghan and Phil Lamar are also back in their starring roles, and so are the amazing Twists and Turns. We know you're going to love it. Listen now at audible.com slash silent order. There are so many amazing days on the way to your wedding day. And Zola's here for all of them. Like the day you find your perfect venue. The day you almost skip to the mailbox to send your invites. And the day you realize making a budget isn't so scary. Zola has everything you need to plan the wedding you want. Like a free website for your guests to RSVP and shop your registry. And those not-so-amazing days? Zola's here for those, too. Talk to Team Z, Zola's expert wedding advisors. Or join the Zola community, full of other engaged couples who know exactly what you're going through. From getting engaged to getting married, Zola is here for all the days along the way. Start planning at Zola.com. That's Z-O-L-A dot com. David, thank you so much for joining us on British Scandal. Well, it's good to be here. So let's start with when you first became aware of Aitken. What did you think of him? Well, at the time, I was a producer on World in Action, which was an investigative TV series. And I hadn't been thinking about Aitken very much at all. And then one day my editor said to me, we're going to start off a new season in the autumn. And... Do you think you could make a minister resign? <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a challenge. Well, it was, and it made me laugh a bit. And at the time, there was a, a rather tired conservative government under the premiership of John Major. 
And I scratched my head and I looked around and I thought, well, there's a couple of ministers I know there that have got skeletons in their cupboard. And one was uh, at the time still in the closet and he was a homosexual. And the other was Jonathan Aitken, who had told a lot of lies to the Guardian newspaper, I was pretty sure, uh, about what he'd been up to in an arms deal. And I thought, well, I don't want to expose people who are gay, but I could have a go at uh, cracking open the Jonathan Aitken case. So I set off to see if I could make him resign. Now, taking on someone that powerful has got to come with some risks. Do you approach these kind of stories with any sense of hesitation or nervousness? Well, at the time, it was a big challenge because The Guardian had made an attempt at uh, exposing what Aitken was up to, and they failed. And what had happened really was that the then editor of The Guardian, Peter Preston, had tried to prove that Aitken had gone to Paris and stayed at the Ritz Hotel on a secret mission and had got the Saudi royal family to pay his hotel bill. And unfortunately, Preston had messed it up rather, and it had ended up with the Guardian's behavior becoming the story. And Preston had to try to get hold of a copy of the hotel bill by sending a fax, which they used to have in those days, to the hotel under Aitken's name, pretending to be Aitken and saying he wanted a duplicate of the hotel bill. And that sort of worked, except when it all came out, Preston and The Guardian found themselves being accused of forgery. Their behavior became the story, and the whole quest in pursuit of Aitken collapsed in a cloud of recriminations. So it was a journalistic challenge to try and break his story out. So when you're doing something like that and reviewing someone's past errors, could you speculate as to why Preston may have taken that approach? Well, I, I know what he did wrong. He made a basic journalistic mistake, which was that he allowed himself to be manipulated by his source. The whole story had originated with a, an Egyptian businessman called Mohammed Fayed, who, who was a bit of a crook himself, and he had fallen out with the British government in a dispute. And he was doing his damnedest to discredit and bring down ministers in the government that he thought had done him down. So Preston rather fell into the hands of this guy, Mohammed Fayed. And Fayed had said, I won't deal with anybody but you because you're the editor. And that was very foolish, actually, because the thing about being an editor is if you do the story yourself, you don't have anybody to edit you. So there was nobody to hold his hand and say, you're making a mistake here. Can you talk us through the stages of embarking on this story? What had to happen first? Well, when you've got somebody in a powerful position like that, who has just said flatly, what you're accusing me of is all lies and you can't prove it, you're facing a mountain to climb. There's generally a way through, and the way through was that we set our team to work to write a huge history of Aitken's whole political career, a chronology in which every single detail of everything he'd done, we, we fed into this chronological machine. And as soon as we did that, it became very clear what, was, what had happened. It spoke to us, and what it said to us was, this is a man who at every stage in his career has been a sort of puppet of the Saudi royal family. Everything he did, he invested in a TV company, but secretly it was Saudi money behind it. Um, he bought a plane, but it was a plane he bought for Mohammed bin Fahd, who was the son of the Saudi king. So at every point, you could see that he was acting as a front man for the Saudi royal family. And of course, the reason why he did that was because these Saudis weren't very nice people, but they had an enormous pile of oil money. As a happy side effect, David, that's great research material, somebody might say, for a book. <laughs> but that's, that's just a benefit that's just sitting there waiting to happen, right? <laughs> so in that process, I'm guessing that people don't just open up their diaries to you or say, yep, yeah, you can go through my correspondence or here's my little black book. I'd love to help you all I can. I'm, I'm imagining that this is a, a difficult story to kind of untangle. 
Well, it was very frustrating. For example, we managed to track down a lot of limousine drivers. When the Saudi royals would come over and Aiken would squire them around London and introduce them to contacts and so on, they would hire a fleet of limousines. And we got to the drivers of some of them and they said, oh, yes, it's all true. He was all working for the Saudis all the time. And we'd say, well, will you come on camera and tell us about it? And they'd say, you must be joking. Of course not. These Saudis, they would give us enormous tips. I mean, like hundreds of pounds in envelopes. And one said, he paid for my daughter's medical treatment. You think I'm going to uh, go on camera and cause trouble now? No way. So we were very frustrated. But eventually, one of those drivers said to me, you go and find Aitken's old secretary, a woman called Valerie Scott. And he kind of rubbed the side of his nose, you know, and said, I think she'll tell you something. And we tracked down Valerie and found her. And indeed she did. And she'd been pretty mistreated by Aitken. And she blew the whistle. You say we. How big a team did you have uh, working on the case? Well, I guess we had about half a dozen people. You you don't have a big team when you're doing an actual investigation. When you're doing the filming, you have like a, a, a big crew, mm-hmm. you know. But when you're actually doing the work, there was me, a director, and a couple of researchers most of the time. And we were running around. I remember went to the Canaries and I found a woman who told me how Aitken had fronted a health farm in Berkshire and it secretly it had been funded by Saudi money, just like everything did. And Another of my researchers went off to Florida and found the man who had sold a plane to Aiken the Saudis could fly around in, and so on. So, you know, a lot of travel and a lot of, uh, a lot of calls and a lot of beseeching people to come across. Because the problem about doing television is you have people on camera. If this was a Hollywood film, the first act would be you struggling to get that break and struggling to get somebody on record or to get that important bit of evidence. As far as I know, the investigation was around six months. When did you start to kind of land those key bits of information or those key testimonials? Well, you do it all bit by bit. And I'm like the little guy in the dirty raincoat going around, you know, knocking on doors. (laughs) Um, And little bit by little bit. You get those interviews together until you've got enough. Well, first of all, you have to be confident that you've understood what happened. And we did, in the end, understand correctly that the story of this man was that beneath the glittering exterior was just somebody who was a puppet of some rather unpleasant rich Arabs. Now, you are having difficulty getting, for example, drivers and stuff to speak. Are you receiving pushback at this point? You know, people giving you trouble? No, no, we're working very quietly. And I suppose some people would say deceptively. For example, I remember we went and filmed an interview with an elderly woman called Irene Maggs, who was the chair of his local conservative association in Thanet, where his constituency was. And she was a very nice white-haired old lady. And we got a very useful interview from her in which she said that she had no idea that uh, he had anything to do with any Arabs or any of the Saudi royals. He'd never said a single word to that in all the time that he was their MP. And we didn't tell Irene Max that we were interviewing her in order to expose her MP. Of course not. Mm. You know, we said, we're doing a profile of this rising young politician who might be prime minister one day. So (laughs) tell us all about how clever he is. So you have to behave in a rather, well, what we would call a discreet way and what Aiken and his friends would have called a deceptive way. Mm. Yeah, that's a powerful carrot. He might be PM. (laughs) Well, I was going to say, He very much thought he was going to be prime minister one day. That was always one of his ambitions. Was there no sort of sense with Aitken that he was at risk and that somebody might be coming after him to do this kind of story? Or was he just sort of overwhelmed by hubris and just sort of thought, I'm safe as houses? Hubris is the right word. Hubris, arrogance, entitlement, a sense of entitlement. He thought he would get away with it because he'd driven the Guardian who come after him into the ground, really. It had been a stalemate. 
And all through his life, he'd got away with stuff. He'd been a gambler. He had done things which would have sunk other people. And he, he got away with it. So I just think he thought he felt pretty brazen about it. He thought, they can't touch me. I'm a big guy. I'm a powerful guy. I've got the whole of the conservative government behind me. And these people are just grubby little journalists. So fool. <laughs> Yeah, he really did have a skill set of his own that you've got to respect, even if he was using it to uh, nefarious ends. Part of that is surely the charisma that people talk about. I mean, is that part of what allowed him to to operate for so long without being taken down? Yeah, he was a glittering personality. He was tall, dark and handsome. He was irresistible to women. He had a life of golden privilege and he rose and rose. <laughs> There were one or two missteps along the way, but he always overcame them. I think people were very impressed by him. They thought he was, he, he was a glamorous figure. At what point would you say you knew that you had him? Well, it was when we got to Valerie Scott, really, and Valerie said, yes, it's all true. Everything he did was for the Saudis. And I was there all the time, and I can tell you all about it. It was then that we knew that our theory was correct, if you like, that the whole thing was about his relationship with the Saudi royals, and it was all about arms deals. In fact, it was all about getting corrupt commissions on arms deals. Aiken was trying to make a lot of money out of this affair. That was the great secret he was trying to conceal. For whatever you're into, Amazon Prime offers a range of services like Prime Video, Amazon Prime Music, and Prime Fast Free Shipping. I've been using Prime Video to watch some of my favorite uh, rock and roll documentaries. And of course, I use Prime for shopping for all kinds of things. I've got a pretty gnarly sneaker habit, so Prime comes in handy there. This is just one example of many ways that Prime can make life a little richer from shopping to streaming to saving. It's on Prime. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime get more out of whatever you are into. This holiday season, get yourself the gift you really want. A smile you'll love. Order your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95 at Byte.com. Byte Clear Aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces. Plus, they offer payment plans, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA or FSA. With Byte, you'll be smiling big at all the holiday parties this year. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Be confident. Be you. With Byte. Did you think, David, when you were hearing these things and putting all these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together, did you think that the scale of this story would be such that it could bring down the government. This wasn't about one guy. This wasn't about one, you know, dirty operator. This was something that could t could shatter an institution. You need to remember that at the time, this was a very tired and stale government, the major government. And in fact, the word sleaze had been coined by the media to describe the endless corruption scandals that had beset this government. They were all <laughs> looking in the eyes of the voters like a bunch of crooks. So, in a way, it, it, if you expose Aiken, it was one more nail in the coffin of this rotten gum. Yeah. Incredible. I mean, apart from the fact that it's depressing and corrupt and disappointing and, you know, scary what people are doing behind the scenes that the public doesn't know about, as a journalist, it must have been so exciting. Well, you're like a detective. It's like a detective story. You know, you are trying to get to the bottom of a mystery. You're trying to hunt down somebody who's uh, hiding in the undergrowth. The excitement of the hunt, in a way, uh, which actually blinded us to the fact that we were actually heading into a very dangerous jungle. Did you encounter any roadblocks that ever made you want to give it up or think, you know, this isn't going to work out? Well, I was looking over my shoulder all the time at what had happened to the Guardian when they tried to take on this investigation. They had failed so badly that it, it ended with 
Aitken triumphant and with the then editor of The Guardian, Peter Preston, actually his own position very weakened and he stepped down as editor shortly afterwards. So you could see that they were dangerous. It's always very dangerous to try and take on powerful people. I didn't realize, to tell you the truth, just how dangerous it was going to be for me personally and for my TV company. Could you elaborate on that? Well, we had thought that we'd got Aiken, all right, we cracked the story, and we worked in collaboration with The Guardian because they had got a lot of research material of their own. And on the morning that we were due to transmit, well, we'd given The Guardian with a taste of what we got, and they ran a front-page story about Aiken, the arms deals, and the fact that he'd been offering to get girls for these Saudis when they came over because they liked Western women. And we thought of that as useful publicity, really, to get a bit of attention for our program. What we didn't know was that Aiken was going to go absolutely ballistic and he embarked on this extraordinary high-risk gamble to stop our show going out. He called a press conference at 6 o'clock that day. We were due to go out at 8 p.m. And he, he made this, he, he glowered into the camera and made this extraordinary speech in which he said, we were the cancer cells, we were the cancer of bent and twisted journalism, and he was going to wield the sword of truth against us by suing us for libel and the shield of trusty British fair play. It was all completely mad. So florid. What did you do? Oh. Where were you when you read those words? <laughs> I'm sitting in the Granada studio up in Manchester where we've been putting the final touches to the edit and I'm watching this stuff on the television. You know, my jaw is dropping <laughs> and indeed the blood is draining from my face. I'm thinking, my God. He's raised stakes so high. This it all seemed to be like a try and preemptive blow to try and stop us actually mm. transmitting the film. And all credit to Granada Television and the World in Action team. They were a famous investigative program at the time, and they were tough. You know? And mm. they said, we're going to put it out. We're not going to pull the show. We're going to recut it right now to incorporate all the things that he said and deal with them. And we've got like two hours to go, so let's get going. And we just turned to and re-edited the whole thing against the clock. Wow. That's so thrilling. That's like riding on a rocket ship. Oh, it was exactly like riding on a rocket ship. It was terrifying. And in fact, what happened was <laughs> we hadn't got it. We hadn't got it done in time yet. And the, the network, they're saying, come on, come on, we need this to tape if we're going to put this out or we're going to cancel the output. And there's just a couple of minutes after eight o'clock when they're still running adverts on commercial television. Wow. And we could, you know, eight had come and gone and we're literally running down the corridor, our directors running down the corridor with the tape under his arm that we've recut and banging it into the machine. At two minutes past <laughs> transmission time. It was, it was. Oh my God. Oh, it was a nightmare. And you're doing that with, I'm sure, the thought in your head, which is we need to have this airtight, you know, the journalistic rigor that has to be the umbrella that covers this whole production. I'm just thinking about recent TV and print stories that have broken about individuals where people have come forward and they've given their testimony, they've made their accusations, and they have to be completely bulletproof and so as you're doing that against the clock you must be thinking we can't have a single mistake in here we can't have anything included that we haven't absolutely held up and so is that not just making your heart pound out of your chest well at that time the libel laws as well were very harsh harsher than they are now so we knew that we had to prove the truth of everything that we were saying it's a bit easier now because you can now claim that you're doing something in the public interest. You don't necessarily have to prove the truth at every point. But you're right, you know, we knew that we everything had to be proved. But we got the people on camera, uh, you know, coming out with it. We were just astonished that Aiken had played this game of poker. He'd raised the stakes so high, he'd like doubled down, more than doubled down, tripled down. And <laughs> we got to that point, then it was going to be him or us. Could you tell us a little bit about watching the show go out live? Well, sitting there watching that 
moment that we cut into it, when Aitken is glowering down at the camera at us, you know, and saying, you're a cancer cell, um, I'm going to cut you out. This was an extraordinary moment to, to see that somebody is determined to ruin you. And I suppose he would have said, you're determined to ruin me. It was a moment that I've never had again in my career, and indeed, to tell you the truth, never hoped to have again, in which you are seeing a villain, which is what Aitken was, mm. actually outbidding you, doubling down in that way and saying, you're not going to get me, I'm going to get you. It's chilling. Chilling. Obviously, it goes without saying, this is a time before getting a Twitter reaction or an instant social media response, the discourse would be in print. So could you tell us about the next morning when the story is on the front page of The Guardian? Well, the next morning, we felt pretty good because we had defied his threats and we had transmitted the show and we were quite proud of ourselves. But then when this whole process of litigation started, I mean, he'd said he was going to sue us and he was stuck with that. And he had to go ahead with his libel case, just as we had had to go ahead with our program. And it was really like the start of the First World War, I think, you know, when all the mobilization plans with Germany and France and England and Russia, or somebody, people pressed the button and the troop trains started to move. And it became a process that was unstoppable, I think. Aker would have liked to have backed out of it, but there was no way out. It was only through. So over the next months and, and years, he and his friends carried on campaigning to try and discredit us and say it was all a smear. And we were frantically running around the world trying to find more evidence that we could use to defend ourselves in the libel case. So it became prolonged motion battle with very high stakes. And what did Aitken do next? Well, Aitken got promoted to the cabinet. It was quite bizarre. Having assured his prime minister that it was all lies, he continued to rise as a politician. Uh, and we were watched really rather awestruck while he, he strutted about the stage and briefed everybody, briefed all the other rival journalists that he was going to pulverize us and crush us into the ground and he was going to win and we were going to be destroyed. So it was a very strange time. What was the climate like with other papers and other journalists? What were they writing and saying about you guys? Did you feel support? Did you feel antagonism? Well, I mean, the other media were our rivals, so they weren't sorry to see us in trouble. Mm -hmm. Many of them were political supporters of the Conservative government, so they were receptive ear to all the poison that Aiken and these chums poured about us, saying it was all a pack of lies. This was a world before Twitter, as you say, but there, there was a whole constant undercurrent of attack on us, of attempting to undermine us, of trying to demoralize us. This was a war, you know. The stress and crowds of holiday shopping can put a damper on your holiday spirit, and you don't always find all the perfect gifts you're looking for. The Virginia Lotteries games make easy and tremendously fun gifts for all the adults in your life, even you. Spruce up your gift-giving game this holiday season with the Virginia Lottery. The Virginia Lottery's holiday scratchers are a gift any adult will love. Treat yourself to some winter wonderment and play the lottery's holiday online instant games from anywhere in Virginia. Visit valottery.com slash holiday. Please gift responsibly. Lottery games are not for minors. So, David, we should talk about a huge chapter in this story, which is, of course, the trial. Could you tell us about being inside the courtroom and what that felt like? Who was there? How did Aitken look during it? When the trial opened at the Royal Courts of Justice, the stakes had got as high as they could be. And not only the stakes, but the money. By now, we, we'd spent about a million pounds on court costs, on lawyer costs, you know, on, on trying to defend it. You'd be astonished at how much money it costs to defend a libel action. When it opened, Aitken and all his friends 
strutting about very confidently. The rival media are all packing the press benches. Aiken and his allies are all briefing them about what's going to happen. Aiken goes in the witness box. He delivers the most smooth performance. Our counsel, George Carman, who was a famous lawyer at the time, <laughs> told us that he couldn't lay a finger on him. Well, that's reassuring. <laughs> well, yes, he couldn't penetrate his defences. And indeed, two weeks into the trial, we had a conference with Carmen, our lawyer, and the new editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger, and all us journalists who have been working on the case. And Carmen said, he said, look, I, you know, I haven't been able to lay a glove on Ake, and this case is not going very well. You know, should we surrender? That was a point at which Alan Rusbridger showed his steel as an editor, in fact. He said, no, we fight on. We're right. We know it. And so we did. And within days of that, that crunch meeting, we actually managed to finally crack the case and obtain the crucial documents which proved that we were telling the truth and he was lying. So this was all quite a melodrama. And tell us what that key document was, please. Well, the whole story that Aitken told depended on him telling one big lie, that it wasn't the Saudi royals who paid his hotel bill at this meeting in Paris at the Ritz Hotel. It was, in fact, his wife, Lelitza, and therefore... We had to crack this story, and we worked out that it had to be a lie because we were convinced that his wife had, in fact, not been in Paris at the time at all, and that she had, in fact, on that very weekend, gone off to Switzerland, to Geneva, where they were taking their daughter to a finishing school. But how could we prove it? We worked out which hotel Lenitza had been staying at. And one of our reporters, Owen Burkop, brilliant reporter, went off to Geneva and he found the hotel and, to his horror, discovered then that it had gone bankrupt some years before. Found out that all the records were stored in the basement and he managed to persuade the Swiss, whoever was caretaking the hotel, to let him go down to this basement and rummage through the old hotel records. And he found it he found the actual docket which showed Lelitza Aiken had spent that weekend at a hotel in Switzerland and had not been in Paris at all. So this was it. It was like, it was like, a, <laughs> it was like a, a story in a movie. He had actually found the piece of paper that proved we were telling the truth that he was lying. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't get more smoking gun like that. <laughs> it, it never happens in life, but it really did. A needle in a Swiss haystack. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely amazing. And so then did he race and, and make the call to you? How, how did that information get relayed? He races back to London. He's on the first plane back to London, waving, waving <laughs> this ticket. You know, we're all completely and utterly amazed. And then there is this cinematic moment. The very next day in the trial... Aiken has been briefing all his friends in the press. It's going to be like Ladies' Day at Ascot, he says. All the women are going to testify. And he has got lined up his wife and his daughters, his teenage daughters, who have all written statements saying, yes, it's all true. The wife paid the bill. It was nothing to do with, with Aiken. This is all a pack of lies. And he's got his wife and his daughters to tell lies on his behalf. They are due to go into the witness box the very next day and commit perjury. This man has got his own teenage daughters to commit perjury on his behalf. It's stunning. And it doesn't happen. What happens is that morning, before Ladies' Day starts, our lawyer, I'm standing there in court watching all this, our lawyer goes up to his lawyer, gives him these documents. His lawyer passes them over to Aiken. Aiken 
stands there in court, and I'm in the corner watching this moment, and Aitken is reading the documents, the killer documents, and his face, it's like stone, you know, absolute mask-like. But at that moment, I'm trying to think what's going through his mind, and what's going through his mind is, the game is up, I'm ruined. And they go to the judge, they say, we need an adjournment, we've got to discuss the whole thing, and we just know it's over. Mm. And it's over. The case is, case is dropped, Aitken is ruined. Wow. Wow. So that's what his face looked like. But what did your face look like, David? <laughs> Goodness only knows. By this time, I was exhausted, you know, worse than exhausted. I'm, I'm, I'm frightened, mm. that's the truth. I mean, the night before, I'd stopped sleeping. I really had. And I remember I, I woke my wife up at three in the morning and I shook her awake and said, look, you, you've got to understand, I've got to tell you this. We're going to lose this case. Mm. And I'll never work again. And what did she say? How did she reassure you in those dark hours? Well, I don't think she did reassure me. I think she was <laughs> as scared as I was. You know, we, the, the stakes had just got so high. It was either us or him. How did you deliver the good news to your wife? But by the time this happened, I was like numb, really. I mean, I, we had been successful detectives because we had worked out what his weak points were. We'd worked out what had really happened. We had like pierced the veil of all his stories and all his lies. And then we had like found our way through the maze of those lies to the truth at the heart of them. And it had been a very long and very tiring journey and a scary one, really. I mean, the fact is that after that, it was a long time before I was willing to embark again with such a carefree spirit on the task of making a minister resign. Mm. Even for fun, even for <laughs> sport. <laughs> and can you tell us what Aitken did after the trial collapsed? One of the things he did was he declared himself bankrupt, and so we never got the money for the costs of the, this whole saga and the it cost the Guardian and Granada a lot of money. Am I right in thinking it was in the millions, David? Well, it was It was nearly £2 million in total, his costs and our costs. His lawyer got paid, but our lawyer didn't get, didn't get paid nearly so much. He did all kinds of tricks. He said that his house, he had a big house in his constituency. He said it was really owned by a Panama offshore company that belonged to his wife's Serbian grandmother. It was all nonsense, you know, but um, it succeeded in depriving us of our money. The main thing that happened was that we wrote to the director of public prosecutions and said, this government minister has committed perjury, so what are you going to do about it? And what they did about it was they arrested him. On the timeline then, how long was that after the trial? Well... The mills of the law grind fairly slowly. It was several months afterwards. I think it must have been as late as 1999 before he actually saw the inside of a jail. But he did. And he served, well, he served a few months inside before he was let out. I think it was seven months. And it was kind of interesting what happened to him because his experience of being in jail, he then turned into a sort of religious career opportunity, because when he came out, he said, I found God, and therefore going to prison has been very good for me spiritually, and from now on I'm going to be a very religious person. Did that seem uh, real to you, or cosmetic? Well, I think when you've had a great fall like Aitken, and when you've ended up in jail, there's a very limited range of career opportunities open to you. <laughs> And that he took the opportunity of one of the few ways you could go, mm -hmm. which was to, to profess humility, to say you found God. He ended up taking holy orders. And in fact, I mean, he's a priest now. He's the Reverend Jonathan Aitken. Remarkable. It's unbelievable. When he makes a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> An important detail after the trial collapsed is, of course, that Aitken went on the run. Did that surprise you? What did you make of that? Oh, he disappeared. Yes. Oh, really, he went off and laid low in America. And his wife as well, Melitza, announced that she was divorcing him and she scarpered too. 
I think both of them probably feared arrest. I think they probably realized that um, now the game was up, they were in very significant legal peril. In 1998, he came home and pleaded guilty. Were you waiting for that? Did you expect him to do that? He had no choice. I mean, (laughs) when you've stood up in the high court and you put your hand in the air and said, I swear by Almighty (laughs) God to tell nothing but the truth, and it's then revealed that you have actually told the judge a provable pack of lies, you can't do anything but plead guilty, can you? A thing that we look at on this show is the aftershocks of stories like this and the kind of ripples that follow in years to come. In your mind, what did this story do for the state of journalism, but also for the public opinion of those that are in power? Do you feel that this has had a lasting impact? The Aitken scandal had a beneficial effect on British investigative journalism because it showed that you could take on the powerful and win. I think that was a good thing because that encouraged me and my colleagues to keep plugging away at exposure journalism, whereas if we'd lost, it would have had the most profoundly chilling effect on British journalism. I don't think anybody would have dared to go as far as we did. And you've got to remember that we mounted a very unusual sort of attack on a serving government minister. Most of the media didn't do that kind of thing. And we were very cheeky, you know. The the film that we made, we called it Jonathan of Arabia after the (laughs) movie Lawrence of Arabia at the time. And uh, we'd hired a camel from a circus and dressed (laughs) up an actor in robes and made him portray Jonathan Aitken as, as, you know, a tool of the Arabs. All this was very outrageous in a way. And had we lost that case, that kind of thing would have ended. Every time you've seen an exposure story since, it's in a way partly thanks to that battle that we all fought and that victory that we won that kept the spirit of investigative journalism alive, if you like. So that's the sort of plug for investigative journalism from me, if you like, which was my trade. But I would also say, that it was part of the tide, the anti sleaze that swept away a rather crooked government that was full of really rather unpleasant people. So to that extent, it was quite hygienic. It cleaned up British politics a bit. How do you feel when you look at the state of politics today? Do you think much has changed? I'm astonished that Such a fuss was made at the time of the Aitken case because he told a lie. And as I said, we we wrote a book and called it The Liar because it was so extraordinary and refreshing to be able to call somebody a liar. I suppose we thought in our innocence that we'd put a stop to lying in politics. But unfortunately, we now see in modern British politics that people lie their heads off, and it doesn't seem to lead to very many consequences. Yeah, what would Britain think of Aitken if he was an MP today? I feel like he wouldn't be the worst of the worst. I feel like in terms of corruption, he might not even be in the top 10. Well, absolutely, yes. When you're surrounded by people just telling a pack of lies and awarding each other contracts, uh, you know, the tide of sleaze is as murky as it ever was, or even murkier, and it's just that... um, Politicians lying doesn't seem to have the same electrical charge and voltage as it used to as as a a horrifying thing. We've now become a bit cynical, haven't we? You know, we think, oh, well, it's a politician and they lie, that's what they do. But back in the day when we exposed Aitken, lying was a big deal. And for you personally, David, as a story in your career, did it contain sort of the worst and the best moments? Well, it was a huge melodrama, and it was a sort of high point in a way because of my own career, because I had succeeded against all the odds in making a minister resign. You did the assignment. You really did did the assignment. I did the assignment, but it was at a pretty high price, to tell you the truth. Mm. It was a high price for my family and for me too. You know, there was a a a lot of sleepless nights involved. And in fact, I've always felt a little bit bitter watching the Reverend Jonathan Aitken 
strolling about. I can imagine. Talking about his new relationship with God, I think. Well, mm -hmm. ha, it would have been nice if he'd ever apologized to me for trying to ruin me and calling me a cancer cell uh, when I was telling the truth and he was telling lies. Yeah, that, that could be part of his uh, journey <laughs> towards <laughs> the light and the truth. <laughs> Maybe you'll get a Christmas card this year. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> David, this has been completely fascinating, thrilling. I mean, what a story and, and what an incredible thing to be at the heart of. Thank you so much for yeah, sharing your memories. Thank you for sharing it so thoroughly and honestly and excitingly. It's really a remarkable story and we're grateful you joined us. Thank you. This is the fourth and final episode in our series, The Aitken Affair. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Pride and Perjury by Jonathan Aitken and The Liar, The Fall of Jonathan Aitken by David Lee, David Pallister and Luke Harding. I'm Rob Delaney. And I'm Alice Levine. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Samizdat Audio. This episode was produced by Harriet Wells. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our series producer is Theodora Leloudis for Wondery. Our executive producers are Rich Knight, Jessica Radburn and Marshall Louie for Wondery. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. Hi, listeners. I'm Donnie Dust, and I'm here to tell you about our new podcast, Rescue. Go deep into the heart of the world's most astonishing rescue stories told by the people who are there. I'll never forget his words to me. They struck me like a knife. He said, Billy, nine guys are missing, and we think they're trapped under your farm. Marvel at the lengths people will go to preserve the most sacred of things, life. At any point, the transmission's going to quit, and we're going to crash in the water, and we're going to die. Because once the engines quit, we probably wouldn't survive. Join me, Donnie Dust, for Rescue. Defying fate, defining heroes. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.